In this example, we want to find a linearly independent subset of a collection of five vectors. We have five vectors here, and we want to find a subset of them that are linearly independent. The answer could be all of them, because if they are all linearly dependent, that's fine. And we're going to do this by going through the process of determining if they are linearly independent, and then we can use the result we get from that to actually characterize this subset. So we want to build the matrix A with these vectors as columns, and then row reduce. So let's build that matrix and go from there. Our first order of business is to put a one in the top corner, which we have right now. Now we can use that one to cancel out all of these below. So what I want to do for my first operation here is I want to set row three equals to row three minus two row one. That'll get rid of that two. Row four is row four plus four row one. And row five is row five minus two row one. So if I do that, my first row does not change. My second row also doesn't change because I had a zero in that spot. For the third row, I'm subtracting two copies of the first row. So two minus two is zero. Minus two minus four is negative six. One minus zero is one. Five minus negative four is nine. And then four minus six is negative two. For the fourth row, we're adding four copies of row one. We'll get a zero as expected in that first spot. Four plus eight is 12. Negative two plus zero is negative two. Negative 10 minus eight is negative 18. And negative eight plus 12 is four. For the last row, I'm subtracting two copies of row one again. So I get zero in the first spot as expected. Negative one minus twice the first row or two minus five. The four stays where it is. Six plus four is 10. And five minus six is minus one. Great, now I move one step inside. So I'm gonna ignore the top row and the first column and I'll focus on this four by four bit inside. I see a one here. So I can leave that one alone, and I want to use that one to deal with the three entries beneath it. So my next steps in this process will be row three is going to be row three plus six, row one to cancel out that minus six. Row four is going to be row four minus 12, row two. So this is row two, not row one, the one I'm actually dealing with in this step. And the last one will be row five, is row five plus five row two, because that will cancel out the minus five. We can copy down the first two rows. They aren't going to change in the step of the process. And now row three is row three plus six row two. So I'll get a zero here as expected. The one's gonna cancel out the minus six as it should. I started with a one here. So one plus six times three is going to be 19. 9 plus 6 times 1 is going to be 15. And negative 2 plus 6 times 1 is going to be 4. Moving down one more row. I'm now subtracting 12 copies of row 2 from row 4. So 0, 0 as expected. Minus 2 minus 12 times 3 is a negative 38. Negative 18 minus 12 negative 30, and four minus 12 is negative eight. Then we have our last row, zero, zero as expected, four plus five times three is 19, 10 plus five is 15, and negative one plus five is four. So we're now at this point here. Now the next step would ideally be to divide this by 19, meaning divide the entire row by 19 to get a one in that spot. However, I can shortcut this a little bit by recognizing the fact that at this point, rows three and five are identical and row four is just negative two times row three. So I can do these operations before I put a one in that spot if it makes things look more convenient. 
usually you'll want to reduce to a one, but in this case, I can do a shortcut step by doing row four is row four plus twice row three, and row five is row five minus row three, give me all zeros in those bottom two rows. And now this here tells me all I need to know. If I want to get to actual row echelon form, I would divide this row by 19 to get a one in that spot. But really, I know there's going to be a one there, which means I will have pivot elements or pivot ones here, here, and here, which means these two are non-pivot columns. What this means is that I could write those two columns as a linear combination of the other three, meaning that this set is not linearly independent. They give me free variables. I can write them as combinations of the other variables. All of that means these are not linearly independent set. Furthermore, because I took the vectors as columns, I know that I can take the vectors that were in column one, column two, column three, and those will be linearly independent because if they weren't, they would have been the non-pivot column. So as a linearly independent subset, I can take the first three vectors. Namely, if I go back to the actual problem statement, it's these first three vectors here. I can take those as a linearly independent subset. That would be an answer here for this problem. Note, this answer is not unique. If I had started by rearranging my columns at the beginning and put the vectors in the matrix in a different order, I would have gotten a different set for this independent subset. However, I still would have gotten three vectors. That's an important fact that we will discuss in the future. But you can get different answers here if you rearrange the columns at the start of this problem. For a problem like this, any set of three vectors that are actually linearly independent would be a valid answer for a problem like this. There's an example of using row reduction to discuss independence of vectors and how you can determine a linearly independent subset of a collection of vectors that's not linearly independent using the pivot columns of the matrix that you get by row reducing the matrix where you put the vectors in as columns.